talk for a second. Debbie's going to talk for a second. Courtney's going to do a slide, yeah. and then we'll just bring the chairs out. We'll do that. Perfect. Yeah. How's right. everybody doing? Yeah. doing? All right. Good deal. Can I ask for one favor? Would you stand up for a second? <laughs> <laughs> Again. <laughs> Get the crack going. Okay. Say hello to the person behind you. Hello. All right. Good deal. All right, that was good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no yoga. So uh, somebody did their homework. I was actually not going to kind of mention that today. Um, and I should definitely mention that. I was, in case you were wondering, like, where your memory failed you, I was never the Secretary of Education. I happened to be the Deputy Secretary of Education one time, um, which is, you know, a little bit different. Um, so what I want us to do in this half an hour is to think about um, a future we don't have right now. Um, an opportunity. I heard now. I heard a guy speaking a couple of sessions ago about the future where none of us have to work that much. We get to hang out and surf and all that good stuff. That world is pretty cool. I, I'm not quite there yet. I'm thinking about a world where things like social mobility, achieving the American dream, having a job, making sure your kids are okay, like those are real concerns and they're hard to achieve for a lot of people. Um, and I'm thinking about a world where imagine if we could start using data and the tools that technology is ch and, and technology that has changed so many sectors to have that same kind of transformative impact in the social arena, in improving health outcomes, in improving educational outcomes, in improving employment outcomes, in keeping people in and away from the criminal justice system and helping them recover more quickly when they touch things like violent crime or anything else that happens to encounter people, especially people who uh, come from impoverished backgrounds at greater rates. So Debbie uh, and I got to do some work together at, when I was a fellow last year at the Bridge Brand Group, specifically on improving social mobility. And we had access to something she's going to talk about called the Social Genome Project, which tried to use a pretty rare data set, um, unfortunately, uh, to begin to help us unpack how you do this in a much more rigorous way than we have in the past. And I want you to use that as a broad frame for thinking about what it could look like if we had this kind of data, it could work over time. And then Courtney is going to come up and talk about a very specific example about where Palantir has worked philanthropically in New Orleans to help them with a very serious problem. And I think you'll be able to make the connection between the kind of real-time work that they've been able to do in New Orleans, given access to certain data sets, and the kind of work that we would like to be able to do across the spectrum that Debbie's going to talk about. Um, it is going to raise all of the questions that I've heard us talking about already about um, the ethics and what do you use and what don't you use and how do you avoid discrimination and how do you make sure that the old rules of you know, institutional bias don't influence us in the future. All that stuff is going to be right present for you so we'll have a good question and answer period. Um, but I want you to just try and make this connection between the broad frame and the day-to-day -day work and with that I'll let Debbie come up. Thanks Jim. Good morning everyone. So Jim and I got to grapple with uh, what we refer to as a wonderful, terrible question, which is really about changing outcomes for people at scale when we think about what philanthropists could do to spur social mobility in our country. And for context, so we live, I live in the social sector, and um, I think it's pretty powerful data to know that social mobility hasn't changed in our country in decades. And at Bridgebend Group, our, our mission is to break cycles of intergenerational poverty, so we really care about that. And part of the work we do is work with nonprofit leaders and philanthropists to change that. So we had this question, and we said as a conceit, if you had a billion dollars, hypothetically, some folks do, um, to catalyze social mobility, what would you do? And the first thing we needed to know is to say, but what matters? What outcomes matter if you really want to make a difference? And we thought, gosh, you know, a lot of us sit within an area. So I'm a partner in our education practice, and I think about education, I think about early childhood development, so kindergarten readiness, and that moves to third grade reading, and then ultimately to high school. Ideally, you'll know about college readiness, that's a little bit harder, and then a degree or certificate worth market value. But we know that a lot matters outside of just academic outcomes. So we think about alongside this kind of cognitive development, what are things that could people pull people off the path? If that's moving people on the path towards economic prosperity, there's some stumbling blocks that are harder to get over like involvement in the criminal justice system, like having a child if you're 18. And so we thought, gosh, you know, I, we want to know all of those, and it would be cool to know about the interrelation between them. There's a real interrelationship among these dynamics. People are multidimensional. And so we're thinking, like, how, how can we lay out this frame? And fortunately, as Jim said, there's a model for that. 
Um, so the social genome model, if you don't know about it, I highly encourage you to look into it. But it's, the, it's imperfect and it's absolutely the best that we have in the sector. So it was developed by the Brookings Institute. Right now it's run by Brookings, the Urban Institute, and Child Trends. And it's a statistical model. It's based on longitudinal data sets. So what we have right now is it's the National Longitudinal Youth Surveys. They're from cohorts of 19 set folks born in 1979 and 97. And it looks over time at kind of what's happened and is able then to see, okay, what are the things, those things that matter if indicators, whether it's, you know, reading and math at age five and moving along those kind of academic performance or suspensions or having a criminal conviction by 19, what are the things that are statistically tied to earnings potential and being able to earn three times the federal poverty level by age 40. But it also shows interrelationships. So we can say, gosh, if we want to intervene and think about that kind of reading and math scores for early childhood for a five-year-old, what are the implications? The, the development in terms of third grade reading scores, et cetera, but then also other likelihoods of things along the way. And so we were very excited to, to know about this and also get to partner with the Urban Institute. So in our work together, we developed a set of investments that were targeted towards some of those outcomes that matter and then partnered with Urban and they used the social genome model to see what the effects would be. What would the economic effects for an individual be if you moved an outcome? So let's take that early childhood that I keep talking about. If you moved it and we, we used research to say like, gosh, how much could it move? So there's some RCTs, we did an ed tech play. That could move by 0.21 standard deviations a five-year-old scores in math and reading. And then what are the implications if we think about all the other effects? That ends up being 50, a little over $15,000 in current dollars. That's a, that's a lot for someone who lives at the federal poverty line of $11,000 per person. So we got them, we worked with them, and we modeled six detailed investments. And side note, if you're curious, our research just published yesterday. You can check out the Atlantic or bridgeband.org. But I'll share another example of early unintended pregnancy. So this is something intuitively I think a lot of us can relate to. Gosh, if you have a child in high school, that probably changes your outcomes. And it does. There's a handful of outcomes that matter. So you're much less likely to pursue education and have attainment of a degree, which um, incurs greater earnings. You're also more likely, if you delay, to be married when you have your child. That's statistically correlated to actually higher earnings for your child. And then probably to be a more effective parent, so increases in terms of um, supporting cognitive development of your child, of emotional support, and ultimately, your children will have better verbal skills. And so putting that all together, the implication if you delay by three years when a young woman has her child, that is, um, results in $52,000 of increased earnings in, in today's value. So that was just a really exciting thing for us to think about putting our investments in context understanding the ramifications of in, if you intervene at a certain point, what are the implications and the end result? Should I, so, so that was one, one slice of what we did. If we have time, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about one of the invest, set of investments themselves. So there's this view of the macro model, but then also just something to bear in mind, I'm not sure how much of, of you, how many of you all work in the social sector, but there's a real challenge in terms of our solutions aren't that great. And so one of our sets of investments was about continuous improvement and thinking about how could we have better solutions, better programs that actually make more of a difference. I told you about a 0.21 standard deviation. I'd like that to be higher. So there's a few barriers in terms of just having the data, the capability to use that data, and then incentives to change. So that's, that's it for now. I think Thanks, Debbie. That's great. So um, you heard that there are multiple points of intervention that are important. Um, one of them in particular that takes people off track is obviously, um, you see here murder clearly <laughs> takes you off track, um, uh, but commission of a crime. Um, and then the things that put you in the vulnerable category for actually uh, even being at risk of that. So what Courtney will talk about is that and some very specific work that happened in New Orleans. Great. Thanks, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about Palantir's work on murder reduction in the city of New Orleans. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Palantir, we are a data integration and analysis software company that's based out of Palo Alto. Um, we've been working with the city starting in late 2011, um, working with a, an initiative called NOLA for Life, 
which is essentially taking a public health approach to murder in the city of New Orleans, recognizing that not just law enforcement and criminal justice interventions, but broader spectrum interventions are essential to a addressing this scourge. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, this is a deep, uh, deeply entrenched issue in the city of New Orleans. Histor it goes back historically well preceding uh, Hurricane Katrina. The city of New Orleans has had uh, a murder rate that's um, historically been uh, 10 times the national average, five times uh, what we find in, in cities of comparable size and demographic composition. Um, uh, and so the city realized uh, in, in 2010, 2011, that it really needed to take a strategic approach to addressing this, this really uh, 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 devastating problem. What we did uh, in stepping in with working with the city was work with existing data stores um, at the city level with NOPD, New Orleans Parish Justice Foundation, and provide a platform for integrating data elements that are already within the possession of those entities into a common analytical environment where the city could start to draw insights out of that data. Um, so mundane insights come out initially. So you start to see things like geographic hotspots, which are, which are useful from a law enforcement perspective in terms of identifying where to place uh, law enforcement and other resources. And also you can see demographic trends um, and understand some of the modalities that a lot of the murders were gun-related crimes. They're happening in public spaces. And they tend to involve feuds that were associated with gangs and groups in the city. But we also discovered that through the analytical platform, we were able to identify non-obvious relationships. So relationships that were drawn from uh, the complicated nature of the data, which was both structured and unstructured. We were able to see, um, by merging together these various data sources, to build out a comprehensive network uh, of, of how individuals might have been involved in these shootings. So in 2012, there was on average about 1.3 shooting shootings per day. And each time one of those shootings happened, an analyst at the city level would, would step into the, the Palantir software platform, um, start to build out this network analysis, and discover these non-obvious relationships based on identifying prior uh, involvements with crimes. And so the strategy that we took was based on research from a Yale researcher, Andy Papachristos, that identified um, that uh, individuals who are, uh, are associated with prior victims of shootings or other violent crimes are 40% more likely to be the next victims. So by building out these social graphs, um, it provides a view into the propensity of becoming the next victim or, or potentially perpetrator. And by looking at the, the social graph, you can start to draw together these non-obvious uh, relationships, which were very powerful from the law enforcement perspective in sort of taking down some of the most violent gangs that were responsible for these murders. But we also acknowledged that this was a powerful tool um, for drawing insights into understanding the, the, uh, the composition of the vulnerable communities. So we could take the same analysis and look at the historical group of murder victims in the city and for each one, build out these, these, uh, these uh, networks over time. Uh, and from the networks, start to compile those into a set of individuals um, that were associated with those prior victims, again, through not various non-obvious uh, interactions. Um, and really, this is, this is kind of the, the highlight of, of what this analysis drew out, is that you can essentially take from a, population, a city with a population of about 380,000 you can reduce that to a group of about 3,000 of the most vulnerable city, the citizens of that community. And when you're talking about a community that's extremely resource strapped, being able to narrowly identify those group of individuals provides you with an incredible set of tools for um, funneling resources at those individuals. So then we could narrow, further narrow that, that group um, and identify the individuals with the highest uh, predictors of violence um, and, and get insights into what those predictors are. Um, we can identify individuals who are already engaged in various programs so that resources could be funneled to those individuals who weren't uh, up already part of the support networks. Um, and identifying indicators that suggested where law enforcement interventions or social services interventions may be most effective. Um, but the key is that we could, get, we could get a group of individuals who were 50 times more likely than the rest of the population and really direct um, the efforts of the city at those groups. Um, but we've talked about, and we've heard talked about earlier in, in, in the sessions today, um, dealing with highly, highly sensitive data. And there's a number of risks associated with that, particularly in the realm of privacy and civil liberties. Um, 
the most important, one of the most important insights that we drew out of um, prior research in this area based on the Chicago model, which was a similar effort built on um, the Yale research that I mentioned, uh, was that treating humans as numbers is a wrong approach to, to this type of problem because humans come, th come through uh, these systems, come to these problems through all sorts of social and cultural factors. And so to be able to look at each individual case and provide a human perspective to ensure that the analytics that are being generated can actually be validated is essential to reducing risks around false positives. Um, and particularly when you're dealing with highly, already highly vulnerable communities, the risks of further stigmatization, discrimination, and disparate impact are particularly high. So those vetting uh, elements um, are proved to be very critical as well as in dealing with um, law enforcement information, which is highly sensitive. Um, so we took the approach of applying tools that are already built into our systems to ensure that we're addressing issues of proportionality, selective access to data, and systems oversight so that the data as it's exposed to a very limited set of analysts for very specific purposes can't then be repurposed for applications that create a lot of these privacy and civil liberties risks. Um, but ultimately what we were able to do in assisting the city in these initiatives is inform another, a number of innovative strategies. So, so the city has used um, community call-ins as a method for bringing uh, troubled individuals into a community setting and delivering a stern message uh, with, uh, with uh, a sort of underlying moral premise that the city and its resources are there to support these individuals and rehabilitate them, but they also know who they are. And so if they don't uh, uh, take advantage of the resources that are available, um, law enforcement may be there to, uh, to intervene. Um, but also to direct social services, recreations programs, uh, um, education programs, and employment opportunities at these most vulnerable populations. Um, applying these techniques also allow the city to identify where family interventions were most essential. Um, and also to, to focus on reentry and, and uh, reintegration services. And then finally, community intervention uh, and community engagement between law enforcement uh, and members of the community. These sorts of programs only work if the community is comfortable with the degree to which this type of information is being applied um, and, they're, and they're aware of how the information is being, is being used for purposes that are deemed to be legitimate uh, and, and ultimately directed at, at uh, rehabilitating individuals within the community. Um, but we need to go further, and so the, the ongoing effort with this, with this program is to focus on earlier and earlier stages of intervention. So for example, looking at social services uh, and education records, um, we can get an understanding of not just how people are, are connected through law enforcement data, but through other modes of, of interaction. And it's really only the data that's the limitation for us. And the more we're able to expose that data uh, in this type of network analysis, the deeper we can go in understanding these connections and the earlier we can get in life cycles to create stronger and stronger interventions. Um, so just the, the highlight of, of kind of the outcomes of, of this type of effort, and I apologize, this, the, the stats and the, these slides are a little bit dated in, uh, in part because um, these are the stats that the, the city was comfortable sharing. Um, but uh, comparing the 2013, 2014 over 2000, uh, uh, 11, 2012 stats, uh, the city saw over 20% reduction in the murder rate, 14% reduction in shootings, uh, and lowest uh, number of murders in, ne in nearly 40 years. Uh, there was a slight uptick in 2015, but we're seeing overall that a lot of these intervention strategies through the NOLA for Life initiatives have been extremely powerful in, in curtailing uh, a lot of the violent uh, crime and murders in the city. So I'll stop there and we can give you a the discussion. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick logistics here. Some <laughs> chairs. Please. Come on. Yeah, good deal. Okay, thanks to both of you. So um, I want to come to you, Debbie, just really quickly, uh, because uh, I want you to react to what Courtney just presented. Um, it is very seldom, unfortunately, that we're able to really apply rigor to solving some of the social problems that we have. Um, you kind of described at the end of, uh, well, actually, the very beginning, you said the social genome model is both imperfect and the best that we have. 
Um, and you talked about the challenge of actually bringing this kind of rigor and continuous improvement to the social sector. So can you talk about that for a second as an overall problem where um, how much time and effort you have to try and pull in when you engage in any of this work to try and get a, a good data perspective about what's going on? Yeah, so I'll answer, I'll respond to both parts of that question, which is kind of the reaction and what it really takes. And when I say that it's the best that we have, it's also just bear in mind that this is a macro overview that has longitudinal data. So I do think that what's really exciting about what Courtney is sharing is that right now we're starting to think of the best of analytics that we have and applying that to social problems. And so it's a consistent kind of approach of deeply diagnosing what is the thing that you want to change backwards mapping to saying what are the root cause or issues, and so looking at the correlations and going to it, and then tying in some of the social interventions which are related, so deep overlap in the work. I think that the, the thing to bear in mind is that there is, in general, not that, that this is really innovative, what Courtney just talked about. What we generally see is kind of a paucity of data, an overwhelm, and then people just hitting up against challenges. So data sensitivity and privacy, and there's just a, we're hoping, a surge that people can ride on in terms of a willingness to overcome that, of saying let's actually use our analytical capabilities and figuring out how people can partner together. You know, deals can be struck in rooms. You can bridge across different governmental agencies. It just hasn't happened very much so far. So, um, so there's a part of this about this, about cooperation and relationships. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mention, so, it's how to bet big on the American dream, I think is the name of the article. Yes, okay. in the Atlantic. Um, and history. Courtney, the name of the book you just wrote at the end of last year is The Architecture of Privacy, yes. correct? So I want you to just talk for a second because there is the part about relationship building and mm -hmm. actually structuring these, but there is also a technical part to the solution that mm -hmm. uh, you're actually pretty expert in. So can you talk about that for a second and how we overcome some of these challenges? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I'll build on Debbie's point. A lot of the data that we applied to this enterprise was all data that the city already had access to. The mm -hmm. challenge that they were dealing with was that it was all siloed and um, in, within different organizations and different uh, uh, data environments um, and different legacy systems. And so breaking down those silos and allowing those different institutions to share the data was in a lot of cases a matter of, of explaining to uh, the city authorities how the, the, the data could be interacted with and handled in a way that's consistent with their concerns, very legitimate concerns around um, the protection uh, of the data and the privacy of the individuals. Um, so our, our emphasis was really on building an architecture um, that allowed the system uh, to, and the individuals who were analyzing the data within the system to use in a responsible manner, um, to provide limited access where that was appropriate, and also to provide the elements of, um, of, of systematic oversight to ensure um, that activity is logged over time and that there's accountability um, for the end users so that the citizens of the community could then uh, have a stake in, in how this information is being used and feel comfortable that the data is not being repurposed or overpurposed for applications that go far beyond uh, what they would be comfortable with. Good deal. So I want to um, turn to the audience quickly for questions because I know that we actually have a limited amount of time. But I want to I want to say something. I want you to react to it. But what I want to say is that one of the things having come out of government that's attractive to me is that this is both something much in it for the folks on the left that are concerned necessarily about the outcomes and impact on mm. um, uh, on populations that are at risk, but also for folks on the right who are concerned about resources and things like that. So. If you could just, from your, each of your perspectives, talk a little bit more, both at the macro level and then at the very specific level about the impact it has on resources and then driving specific outcomes for vulnerable populations, I'd appreciate it. I'll just briefly share criminal justice reform. I think that's something that folks are realizing. People are really coming across both sides of the aisle. And it is an absolute kind of moral standpoint and addressing structural racism standpoint from a lot of us on the left. But from the right side, it is just an extraordinary use of resources, what we expend in our prison system today. And so I think that kind of saying, there's this recognition and figuring out smart solutions that can save money and truly actually just save lives, the implication of being involved in the system. 60% of people who um, have been in prison cannot find a job within a year. And so saying like, how do we break these cycles in a way that's actually profitable um, for our country is something that people are really coming together on. And f from my perspective, in, uh, in the context of this particular uh, set of interventions, really dealing with a jurisdiction um, that, uh, that has a number of issues that are under two consent decrees right now, 
Um, they're, they're strapped financially. The NOPD has uh, been on a decline in terms of the force um, uh, for a number of years. Uh, and so anything that can be brought to bear um, to uh, the city, to um, police department, to community services, social services, family services, to be able to give them a sense of how they should triage their resources um, and identify the most vulnerable uh, elements of the community, um, again, without creating those risks of stigmatization, um, is, is critical for them to be, to be able to operate efficiently and operate at all. So I want to come to the audience for questions, I want, but as we do, I want you to just imagine the very specific example that Courtney laid out and just put it against a different problem. Um, ninth graders at risk of not graduating from high school. High schools that successfully graduated un at risk of not going either to the best college they could or enrolling in college at all. You could even roll back further, parents at risk of not being able to get their kids prepared for kindergarten. Um, imagine being able to take disparate data sets and actually understand who and, and with, if what best intervention to intervene in order to get the best possible social outcome. And with that, I'll come to the audience for questions. In the back there. So uh, in the attempt to get people to break down those silos uh, and come to those agreements where they are going to share data, can you talk a little bit about how you've given them examples of non-obvious correlations? Because that's often what they look for. Because you know, we, we sometimes go to the obvious, but it's really the non-obvious which, which is the value for people. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this comes out of initially some exploratory analysis. Um, but the You'd be surprised how quickly those non-obvious relationships really start to, um, to bear themselves out. Um, it, it really is the problem with institutions that have such fractured data stores that they're so accustomed institutionally to dealing with separate terminals for all of their data um, and separate reports um, that they don't have the mental space to be able to fuse that, that data together. But if you can come up with a dynamic model for being able to um, take all those data, those data sources with different um, ontologies or different ways of representing the information and combine it into a common place where individuals can ask conceptually oriented questions against that data as opposed to writing SQL queries against one database and, and against another and reading reports in another. Um, you really start to see that the, the analyst's intuition um, gets amplified by, the, by those opportunities. And they can focus, the analysts can focus on, on really applying their subject matter expertise as opposed to wasting a lot of their, their mental capacity on the really mundane tasks of going through the data. Is there a way that you, um, how did you get through the initial hurdle, right? I mean, that, that takes a lot of trust to get you to be able to dump all the data into the different places. Were there some initial analyses that you were able to provide that got people comfortable taking that step? Yeah, so I, I mean, there's, there's no easy way of getting over those initial hurdles. It's a mix of, of um, contractual agreements and setting the right precedents in terms of, in terms of uh, agree, uh, uh, formal legal agreements. And then there's the procedural element of ensuring how the data will be handled in a way that people feel comfortable with. And then once you get into the technical elements, you really can start to show these connections and as you start to develop the analytical insights, people are drawn in. They want to be a part of that enterprise. And that's where you really start to get uh, the, the amplification. So that's great. Does that mean it takes a leader just being willing to take the risk? I, I think in a lot of cases, you do need a strong leader to be able to step up and help break down a lot of those silos across the organizations. Is that consistent with what you've seen? Yes. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, let's get this guy over here, and then we'll Come back there. How much time do I have, by the way? About uh, three, four minutes. Okay, good deal. Hi. You mentioned that for some, these efforts to work, you had to get the um, sort of the community on your side and, and have them uh, understand what was going on and agree with what, what the efforts were. Do you ever face any difficulties um, sort of breaking down the complexities so that they can explain to someone who might not be in that field and what do you do to overcome it? So I'll just, or, um, I just want to underline this, this point because there is a, a wave now of recognition in the social sector, the importance of engaging people in their own solutions. And so whether it's called constituent engagement, involving residents, but this idea of people being equipped 
to understand, kind of to diagnose what's going on, understanding what option is available to them. So having a kind of, you can think about it as a customer mindset, but this idea of engaging people, sharing with them what's available and kind of how to access what is or create new solutions is incredibly important. I think Courtney can have more of a technical solution, but that just want to name that because it's really important, I think, for better solutions. Yeah, I think I think it's a mix to, to really get the, the benefits of this type of, of analytical approach. You need a, a mix of someone who's a strong data scientist, but also has subject matter expertise, understands um, the social implications of of the problems that they're addressing and can put that analytical work in context. Um, the work that we started to do didn't really start to click until um, the city was able to hire a very strong analyst. And it didn't have to be a hyper-technical analyst. It was just someone who um, had the ability to, to really look at the data um, and ask important questions and start to draw out those, those non-obvious connections um, based on their own intuitions and what they've seen in data historically. And I want to just put on top of that again that there is the small p political dynamic that needs to be managed by people um, as these data sets start to be used. Uh, the benefits need to be, be explained. Um, and the, the attentiveness to the risks that Courtney laid out needs to be um, front and center uh, so that people understand that you are managing the risks uh, and for trying to protect the people who need to be protected in the process. Um, that is probably the most risky part of this work. Um, and so as anxious as I am for us to build the capability to do it, I am extremely worried that irresponsible people will rush into the field because it does have a potential huge payoff for, for communities. Um, and so we just need to be really thoughtful on both sides of this. Uh, last question, I think is back here. Um, first of all, thank you for, for sharing with us uh, these interesting projects. Um, my question is more um, in terms of so you're talking about correlations, and that's very uh, on the exploratory side. But when you're talking about investments, you're most interested in, I guess, causation. And correlation does not imply causation. I mean, you could have forwards, backwards, or uh, that's difficult. So how do you how do you uh, determine causation for selecting your investments? Sure. Well, we we orient the term that we use for this is a bet. And so inherent in this is some kind of bet, and we don't have absolute causation. And we haven't even talked about risks, like implementation risks, political pushback. But I think part of this is just recognizing where we are today is untenable. And so using the best of the data and not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good and building on those correlations and testing it out because a lot of what we've seen are sub not just um, muted effects but subscale solutions. And so being able to have a much larger data set from which you can ultimately drive causation. I just add to this that the, the analysis, um, specifically building off the social, social genomes, predictive analysis components, relies heavily on using uh, things that have actually been studied to the point of actually understanding the causation, yeah. actual understanding causation. It makes it uh, imperfect in terms of using it for innovations upon that base, but it does allow you to kind of start in that place. Um, I always like to say that, uh, you know, the best thing we would possibly be able to do is to p just pay for the outcomes that we want. Um, the next best thing is to pay for the probability of that outcome, and that's what you're doing with evidence, right? Um, so anyway, yeah, sorry. I'll just make a quick remark there. One of the, one of the insights that, that we tried to, um, to promote in our, our efforts was um, because of the sensitivity of, of the data that we were dealing with and the, the um, potential of, of the outcomes that were associated, um, we constantly, we could have developed an algorithm that crawled through the data and identified those connections um, fairly readily, but we, in every point, erred on the side of, of keeping the human in the loop. And that was essential from the, the aspect of culpability, but also because of that subject matter expertise is really critical in being able to, to eyeball um, the, the analytical outcomes and ensure that the data is actually telling you what, what you want it to tell you. Um, and then you can make those, 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 um, those uh, smart decisions on the fly, um, but you also have this sort of oversight of the system so that you can go back later in case there's a false positive that's generated and you have that element of culpability um, so that there's still a human that's responsible for the decision making. And just to put a fine point in this as we close out, as we get better at this, um, or as this becomes more prolific, the notion that the algorithms we build reinforce the institutional biases that we've had all along um, is one of the big threats of this work. Um, and so really understanding how we begin to, through human intervention and other strategies, unpack the things that 
are actually causal because we've made them that way. Thanks very much.